Okay, I guess we should pick up where we left off. Um, which means I'd better open the file here, I guess. That would be that would be helpful indeed. Yep. And this is where we were. And I looked at the code once I got home um, on Monday. And one of the things, we, I, I wanted to make some changes to the code. This is what happens. Sometimes you'll be in the middle of a project and say, okay, some of this is not good. For example, we have some bad variables, like timestamp. Well, what, what time is it? You know, what does that really mean? And that's the one that's here inside of customer. And really it would be better if we said Q entry time. Now we know what it stands for. So that's a much better um, name for it. Uh, unfortunately, that means we have to change all the occurrences, but luckily um, we can do a replace all. So I can replace timestamp with Q entry time. And that gets um, all of those fixed. Now here I have the start time and end time. Again, yeah, well, start of what, end of what? I think this would be better as the room entry time. So in fact, why don't I do this? Let's um, change start time to room entry time. And then the end time Let's change end time to room exit time. And current time is fine, right? We, we can keep that exactly as it is. So now we have some better names. And you'll notice, by the way, I've been using, I almost all your editors will have a global search and replace. I don't know if you've used those before where you can replace all the occurrences. It's very handy to be able to do that. So that takes care of this. What should be exposed via the setters and getters? Now, if we were doing this, if I had a lot of time, I would go through and do an analysis of each of the properties of the field of the classes and say, okay, which things do I really need other people to be able to set and which do I need to be able to retrieve? And frankly, I... That's a lot of work and I don't want to take the time to do that. So I'm going to do something sneaky. Instead of having everything being private, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it to protected. What protected is, is it's one level more secure than public. Public is anybody can use it anywhere. If I make it protected, then it's not available to just everybody in the universe. But all of these properties will be available to all of the classes that are in this package of classes. And that's what I like. So I don't have to write getters and setters. So I'm sort of avoiding the problem. It's terribly unprofessional of me, but I um, mean, again, sometimes you have to ship the product and that's what we're gonna have to do for today. We could come back later and clean it up. Uh, let's see, talk about this. When you exit from the room, you should probably reset everything in the interest of cleanliness. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab all this code here. And let's call it a public void reset room. And then here, I can reset the room that I've created in the constructor. And when I exit, I'll do a call to reset room. And good, it still compiles OK. I just want to make sure of that. And that'll make the room available and just make sure that all of the numbers are zero. I I don't like to have numbers from the last occurrence hanging around. Um, what other things? Who is responsible for keeping track of average waiting time? And do we want to keep track of the maximum waiting time? Yeah. This is interesting. I was like, you, sometimes when you have to calculate something, you have to know which class is going to do it. Okay, the customer class does not keep track of the average waiting time. 
because each customer doesn't care about the average for the entire simulation. The fitting room certainly doesn't keep track of it because the fitting room is only keeping track of how long that person is in the room and they don't care how long they had to wait in line before they got into the room. That leaves only one possibility and that one possibility is the main method. The main, the simulation itself is gonna to have to keep track of it. Actually, and I think I might have a, something in the chat here. Do I wanna to reset total time when I reset? Um, no, no, I do not. Good, good, good point. Because that's the total time that the, the room has been in use. And so I don't want to reset the room. So here in the constructor, I'll say, yeah. good caps, thank you. Yeah, that, that, that would have been really sort of bad if I hadn't, if, if you had not pointed that out. Yep. That brings us to the next topic here, which is bottom up versus top down design. What bottom up means is, if I could spell it, it would help. Start with the parts and put them together into the big picture. So that's what I did. I did the customer and the fitting room, and now I need to put them together into the main method that does the simulation. A top down design would have started with the big picture and built a framework, check to see that the framework worked, and then add the individual parts. Okay. And why I chose bottom-up design, it was not a conscious choice on my part. It just seemed at the moment that that was the best way to approach it. Some people enjoy doing top-down development better. I think I have a preference for bottom-up for some reason. I'm not sure why. But... Oh, well. Um, and sometimes, by the way, you'll have this, something where you're doing bottom up and then you do top down and they meet in the middle. I've seen people actually design things that way. Okay, now we are going to go and have to put together the big picture. And here's uh, where, we, where were we here? So for each of I see if I need to generate a customer, if so, I generate an NQ them. Then I check all the fitting rooms to see if they're available or not. And if it's available and anyone's in the client queue, then I DQ and put them into the fitting room. And I actually drew a picture to see that this was what I really wanted to do. So let's say here's the, all the fitting rooms are uh, filled and we have these people in the queue. And now let me try and move this aside. So step one is to check if a customer has arrived. Let me put that down to 14. Yeah, let's presume that one has arrived. So let me duplicate the slide. If so, and queue them. And we go here. Copy and paste that, and let's uh, make it okay. Great. Now the next thing I'm going to do, and by the way, normally if I were doing this, I'd, I'd do this with paper and pencil and I'd actually draw a diagram. But it's just almost as almost as easy to do this with one of these drawing programs. So now the next thing I have to do is go to each room and see if it is available. Um, actually, no, I don't want to see if it's available because nobody's available right now. What I want to do is go to each room and advance them one second. Remember that tick method that goes one second? Okay. And if anyone is done, they leave the room. Okay. 
So that means this person's done, let's say. And so they leave. Actually, this really is. And now, 2B is going to be, if anyone is in the queue, put them in the room. I'm going to do that for every room that I have. And so that means that this person is going to go into there. And all of these people are going to move forward in the queue. So that's my plan. Also, what, are, what else has to be done with this? I have to add their waiting time to the total waiting time, right? Because remember, I want to get the average waiting time that they've been in the queue. And that's going to be waiting time is the current time minus the queue entry time. Do I want to check to see if that, do we want to check for the maximum wait time? Would that be interesting to know? Um, to know? It's not in the original specification, so let's, let's, let's skip that for now. Okay, so now I have, oh, what the hell happened here? This is weird. Okay. I don't know, it sort of looked like it was boldface for some reason. Okay. Oh, by the way, I'll upload this um, thing here. But again, I would normally draw a picture and you know, move things by hand and draw arrows around on it so I could see what the heck was going on. So for example, here. Oh. I might, uh, I'm not going to go to the, I'm not going to go to the trouble of doing the artwork, but I would probably draw an arrow there. This really helps to have a picture of what's going on so you can have a mental model of it. Okay, another couple of things I wanna do here is this 3,600 divided by current customers per hour. What's 3,600? So what we really would like to have here is a final int seconds per hour is 3,600. Now it's never gonna change, although it's a constant, but it's nice to have that. Also, when I have a customer here, um, by the way, this should be the next in six plus one because they could have six items, right? So this is going to be max items. And in here, we will have a static final integer max items. That way, if I ever need to change that, I can change it in one place. And then instead of a six, which is sort of, well, where the hell did six come from? Okay, well, we know where six come from is now because it's the max items. It's meaningful. I also have um, seconds per minute. I could make this a, a constant for that. That's, an, that's sort of iffy because, uh, sure, why not? As long, as long as we're going to going to do this, we may as well. Okay, so far so good. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start putting in this stuff here. We have the fitting rooms and we've been printing them out just to see that they work. Put a dividing line in there. By the way, let's compile this to see if we don't have any errors and let's run it. Okay, we've got four rooms, perfect. So far, so good. Okay, see if we need to generate a customer. So what we need to do here is, 
This is the magic arrival number. So we're going to say if generator.nextInt plus one is our magic arrival number. And let's say there's, again, we had 12 people per hour. That's every uh, 300 seconds, correct? Yeah. So if the magic number comes out to 300, that means we have a new person coming into the queue. Otherwise, we don't. In fact, let's just do this just to... Again, I like to test things out uh, and see what happens here. Oh, yeah, how about compiling it first? Well, that's interesting. Hmm. Oh, that's because I said next int, and I forgot to put the bounds on it. Magic, when I do just next int, that gives a number from zero to the maximum possible integer. No, I want a number between zero and magic arrival number plus minus one. When I was testing this out, by the way, at home a couple of days ago on Monday, I'd made exactly the same mistake. So that shows that I never learn. Okay, so it looks like we have customers here. So here is during the first hour, approximately have one, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen customers. Okay. So that's approximately right. Again, it's random. We might get more than twelve, we might get less than twelve. Okay, so I'm happy with that. So now we know that at least that part is working. And now what we're going to need to do is we're going to have to generate them. So we're going to have to have a customer. Oh, this is one I need some advice. Um, I was asking online about this. Is it okay to name a variable the same as a class? Um, but with a just the upper and lower case is different. And I don't know if that's confusing or not. I, I'm I'm conflicted. Is it, does, it, does this put anybody off? Is this confusing to everybody if I name them the same or not? Then let's keep it that way. Okay, then we're going to have to have a new customer. And the number of items is going to be, oh, damn. This is interesting. It looks like I'm going to have to duplicate this maximum items here. because I'm going to need it in this class also. So that's a little bit ugly. Oh, wait a minute. No, ha ha, I just realized. Since this is, this is available to me. New customer, fitting room dot max items. That's how, and we need a random number in that range. So we're going to say generator dot next int of the number maximum items plus one. And what else do we have for a customer uh, when we create them? The time per item. Um, and the queue entry time. Okay. So how long is it going to take them per item? And the second that they came in, that's going to be our their entry time. So now this has to be a number between... I had this I had this before. I thought I calculated this somewhere else.
Okay, this is interesting. I don't think I need the time per item because I'm generating that. randomly in here when the customer enters the room, correct? Then I figure out how long it's going to take them. Is everybody clear on what's happening here? Let me write this down. Okay, let me write down what the what, what the problem is that I'm trying to solve. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm already doing one at the end of the fitting room. I'm generating the end time randomly based upon the number of items. No, I still need them. These are different, okay? I'm sorry, I'm sorry I'm so confused here, but again, I need to know what's really going on. Different. Let's look back at this, this one here. I'm taking this. That presumes that there's one minute for each, correct? So it, it takes them one. This formula is really weird, isn't it? We said it was a random number between one and three and max items is also six. That's where I'm getting ro going wrong. So what we really want is client dot Time per item. And this time per item is going to be in seconds. Okay. No, it's measured in half minutes. Okay. So that's going to be, since this is in half minutes, yeah. And then here we really do need to create a random number that tells how many half minutes there are going to be. And it's between zero and maximum half minutes. In fact, let's change this a little bit here. That way we'll be able to see what the customers got generated. Yeah. Okay, this is much better, okay. So three items, one and a half minutes per item. Does this look right? It looks like we're, 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 get, we're getting somewhere on this. Now, I somewhere I need to do the, and here, perfect, yeah, this is, 
times 60 because we want to convert everything to seconds. And since these are half minutes, we're taking seconds per minute divided by two. Okay. Now I know what I'm doing. But again, sometimes I have to write this down, think it through, and write it down as I think it through to convince myself. And then now that I'm sort of convinced that I got things going, I'm, I'm happy. Okay, Whew. finally, we got our customer created. And now we have to enqueue them. Um, what's the name of our queue that we had here? So clients.enqueue. Customer. Now I need to check to see the fitting rooms to see if they are uh, and advance them one second. So for int i is zero, i less than rooms dot length, i plus plus, I'm going to say room sub i dot tick. And that will advance them one second. And if it's exit time, then they'll exit from the room. In fact, let's put some debug output in here. Then after I've done that, I need to check to see if it's available. Yeah, I think I got actually got rid of the brace that I there we go. Then if clients, uh, you know, clients is a terrible name. Let's call it the client queue. Yeah, that makes things a lot better. So if it's not empty, then that means somebody's in line, correct? And that means that we have to dequeue them. So we're going to have customer C becomes client Q dot DQ. Correct. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have to say room sub I dot enter. That customer enters that fitting room. And then we can say this is not out dot print line. But Customer. Now, besides that, okay, let's just, let's just see what happens when we do this, okay? Well, that's interesting. Um, it needs a customer and an integer when I enter. Oh, yes, we need their entry time, don't we? Okay, and that's the current second. Notice, by the way, we haven't done anything with our waiting time, okay? In fact, I don't even have it here in my simulation yet. So that means we're going to have to declare things. We're going to have to say int total time in queue. Right.
and the average time is going to be total people dequeued because we want the waiting time for all the people who have who have been served. Um, need to do more thinking on that, okay? Oh, my goodness. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Did I call it total waiting time? No, total time in queue. Let's call it total waiting time. No, I really do want the number of people that I've dequeued. That's correct. There we go. Okay, fine. As soon as I dequeue a client, that means they're out of the queue. They're no longer waiting in the queue, correct? That means I'm going to add on their queue, and the, whatever second it is now, minus the time that they entered the queue. And total people served. Are going to be there's one more person served and then i can put them into a room so again i said i have to decouple the time they're in the room versus the time that they are um in the line those are two different things that was what we, you had the question about last time and it's still something that we have to keep in mind and think about okay and let's see what happens when i do this here Okay, so we have a generator customer enter a time for two fifty this at time business. I've got to get rid of that. Where's the one that says at? That's interesting. Where is the Oh, that's the problem. Got it. It's customer dot two string. There's a rule, by the way. There's something interesting. I'll put this in the notes. Add a two string method. Always return it without a new line. Let the person who receives the string decide whether they want a new line or not. There we go. I still have this at time 1493 and I'm, oh, I know why, duh. I think I know why. You know what? I'm going to worry about that later because I have the information I want. Okay. Now, once all of our seconds are done, that's the end of this loop here. Yes. By the way, for those of you who are using Genie, notice that when I have the 
cursor in front of the opening brace, the closing braid is just highlighted in blue. So it's an easy way for you to check to see that they match up. Also, I've been keeping my indent indenting pretty much straight, so that helps. So let's do this just on, on top print line. Number of people still in queue is going to be client queue dot size. So this will tell us how many people are still in the queue. And then I'm going to say double average will be double total waiting time divided by total people served. Um, Notice, by the way, that I'm sort of schizoid about whether I'm using println or printf. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's good programming practice or not. Sometimes it's, okay, what's the first thing that came into my head? Should I make them all printf to be, to be consistent? What do you think? Or should I just leave it as it is? Pardon? It doesn't really change um yeah it, it, it's not an efficiency thing it's just uh yeah uh, how 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 rigid and uh inflexible am i about rules and I, at this point nah okay so there's nobody in the queue when i'm done and the average wait time was two seconds that doesn't sound right yeah this means that we're going to have to do a little bit more work to see exactly what the heck is going on. Okay. Well, it could be. Let's try something. Let's go instead here. We have the simulation has four rooms. Let's say we have 40 people arriving per hour. This should be interesting. And now I have 21 people and my average wait time is 912.9 seconds. So when we have more people, okay, there are people that are waiting. Let's say I have 20 people per hour. I should have less of a queue, correct? And this 14.6 seconds is so, the, boy, it makes a really big difference. Apparently there's four, four fitting rooms looks like there's enough. What if I take, instead of four fitting rooms, I have only two fitting rooms with 20 people per hour. And then the average wait time balloons up. So this, now, am I sure that this, uh, that this is working exactly the way it ought to? The answer is no, I am not. I really need to put in more debug output on this to make sure that things are happening at the time I think they're supposed to happen. But I don't want to do that right now uh, because we're running towards the end of the time. But do you see how I've been, been been building this? Yeah. So this is definitely not a finished product. What I will try and do this afternoon and tomorrow is I will work on it and I will clean everything up. If I find any errors, I will obviously correct them. And then I will upload that, okay? I'll upload what I have here today. And if anybody wants to take a stab at um, trying to fix all, trying to see what's going on and fix it, that would be terrific. I was about to say, are there any questions? But there's probably there's nothing but a gigantic question mark in front of your in your head right now. Correct. <laughs> uh, I've done a lot of code here. My suggestion is that you definitely go through and review this code, and you may want to um, look at the video so you can see it happening again step by step. But again, this is the process that I go through when I'm doing my 
normal programming. I do some design and then as I go along, I see, oh, this isn't going to work and I have to rethink things or think them through more carefully. Uh, let me just check something here real quick. Uh, Professor, do you have any comments to make? Is there anything to add? I, I, I'm, I'm not I'm not happy with this code. It, I, it's sort of no, I think this is great. I mean, this is a great demo of actually how software development is done in high tech companies. It's excellent. This is a short demo, but it's great. But is the code always this fragile? It's always. <laughs> I've done that for many years. It is. Is there? Yeah. Don't yeah, worry. So about it. It's great. Excellent. So he's you saying, yeah, yes, the, the code is usually this fragile. You might want to check the two string. I think your two string already print out at times. That's why it's double. Which two string? The customer two string already prints out at times, I think. Uh huh. And then I've got another at time that I'm doing here. That's. Thank you. That fixes that problem. At least I got one problem fixed before uh, I have to go and do a, a, a better analysis of this. Also, there is one thing that I did purposely wrong, by the way. Okay, the, the, or purposely a bad a bad thing to do, and that's this. I noticed that nobody gasped in horror as they saw this. Okay. What's wrong? This statement works. There's nothing in terms of doing the correct thing, it does the correct thing, but why is this bad programming style? Let's take a look at the definition of available. Do I have split window? Yes, stop one. This is already a boolean, isn't it? So what value could it, what value should it have? Either true or false. So do I have to compare it against true? It's either going to be true or false already. I'll have to say if the room's available. I don't have to say if if whenever you see yourself writing something like equal equal true or equal equal false, then that's a big red flag that says no, I don't need to do this comparison. You either have to say if rooms I dot available or not rooms I dot available. And that'll give you back a true or false value because it's a Boolean. And this is a very common error. I mean, I wouldn't take off points for that, but I would just put a comment in the um, evaluation saying, you know, you really don't need to do this comparison. And this is the kind of thing that you learn over the years as you do more and more programming. You learn that, okay, here are some things I don't need to do anymore. Okay, that having been done, we can now look at the assignment, which is the project. And it's due on uh, March 8th. So I'm giving you a lot of time to do it. This is a group project. And you're going to have a program called checkout.java that uses queues. And but before I got, there's one thing I, I almost forgot to mention this. And that is, if you look at this code, Here's this DQ here, and NQ is somewhere up here inside of the fitting room, I think. Uh, no, there, there's a, um, where, where am I NQing? Yeah, here's where I'm NQing a customer, and here's where I'm getting rid of it. There's almost nothing to do with queues here. There's only two lines in this whole gigantic program that have to do with the queue, and this is this is normal. That's the whole reason that we have the queue. That way we don't have to worry about the extra effort of, okay, well, how do we create a queue and put somebody in it? How do we take a, somebody out of the queue? All of this code that is inside of queue.java takes care of all that crap for us. So we don't have to create an array list and push things onto it and remove from the end. That's the idea of the abstraction. We just say, okay, put this person in the, take this person out of the queue or put this person into the queue and all the busy work 
of moving an array list around is taken care of for us. Okay, so even though there's only two lines, it's also saved us a lot of intellectual overhead. We don't have to waste any neurons on, okay, gosh, how do I represent a queue? How do I put things in? How do just let the queue take care of it. It already knows that crap. So you might going to find this on your queue project when you do this. The actual queue itself is not going to be the major part of it. The major part of it is the logic of getting everybody into the queue and out of the queue at the right time. That's where we've been spending all of our intellectual effort when we wrote this program here. So you're gonna, your group is going to write something called checkout.java, and you're going to have three different models for self-checkout stations. Scenario one, you've got one line for customers with N checkout stations. This is the way it works at the Safeway where I am. And you go to the next available station. This is a lot like the fitting room, by the way. You had one queue of customers, and they went to whichever fitting room was available next, yes? So some of the code that we've developed here, you might want to look at it and, oh, hey, I, I can use some of the ideas for that. Now, another one, you would have N lines for customers with one checkout station per line, and you go to the line with the fewest customers in it. Yeah. And I think that's the way it works at one of the smart and finals that I go to. They have different, uh, different lines, and each one has its own checkout station. And usually everybody goes to the one with the fewest people in it. And then the third scenario is, again, N lines for customers, one checkout station per line, and you randomly choose which line you go to. And we're going to run each system for two hours with a clock that ticks every second. And then you're going to ask how many customers were served in total, what's the maximum queue length, and how long did they have to wait? That is the time from when they entered a queue until they were at the checkout station. If there's any other statistics that you think might be interesting, great, put them in. And um, here's your queue.java file, so use that. If you want to modify it, eh, I guess you can. Don't copy and paste it into your program. Just put it in the same directory as your program and upload everything to me and then I can, so I can compile and run it. And then you'll run the program and write up a document. Well, as you can see right here, you can't just sit down at the keyboard and write the program without doing any thinking about this. Hey, can you imagine what would have happened if I hadn't done any planning at all? We'd be, we'd be here in, at the middle of April still working on this thing. So here are some of the things that I had to consider. So you may want to think about all of those. And you'll write down all these decisions before you start programming, just the way I did. I wrote down all of these. And some of your assumptions may turn out to be completely wrong. That's okay. The other, none of this is engraved in stone. It's engraved in jello. And once you have your decisions, you can use them as a checklist. You know, have I done all the things that I plan to do? And then you're going to write a report. Um, let me see if I can open that in a new tab. <laughs> and so everybody's name is going to be on it. And then, you know, it's going to, for example, if, Give it, 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 it details what all the assumptions are. Yeah, it takes 20 to 40 seconds to pay it a self checkout. Yeah, like that. that's wishful thinking. <laughs> but yeah, just go with whatever you you, you presume is the, be the best estimate of these things. And then I was looking at how many customers were served, how many remained in the line, what's the maximum line length, how long they have to wait. And what was the average time that the checkout stations were in use? I never did that, by the way. I should have also on, gone back and say, how long was each of the fitting rooms in use? Remember, that was one of the things I wanted to do. But I uh, ran out of time on that. And when I do it this afternoon, when I fix it so this afternoon or tomorrow, I'll, I'll fix all of that stuff. I'll put it in. Okay. So you're going to have that. Uh, five to six students who will be assigned to their groups by the instructor. I've already done that. 
Uh, if we go to student view. Okay. Under people. And you should be able to see this yourselves. Under groups. I'm named, I was going to call them group A, B, C, and D, but you know, that would rank them somehow. So I just picked the names of four minerals, which don't have any value judgments associated with them. And they all begin with the letter C for some reason. And if you look at this, you can see who is in your group. You can also go to the people and you'll be able to communicate with them. Okay, so if you want to open up a Discord for yourselves to um, work, that's great. If you want to just communicate by email or by Zoom, I, I don't care how you communicate, or if you want to communicate during lab and you're physically here, that works for me too. Uh, where was it? Cheap project there. So you will decide to break into further subgroups. So you might have two people who are responsible for the one line model, two or three people for the fewest people model, and the remaining students for the random choice model. And all of these subgroups will be responsible for the overall design. So you're all going to have to work on that. So that way everything is coordinated. Yeah. Question? OK. Program is going to be checkout.java. If you do modify q.java, upload it so that I will have a copy of what you were actually working with. Uh, I'll change this. It shouldn't be last name, first name. I'll, I'll have a group name. Okay. So only one person needs to submit that. Uh, and then there's a teamwork document. And the teamwork document talks about how you all work together as a team. Associated with this is also a separate thing, which is the group project survey, where you do a self-evaluation and an optional evaluation of some other group member. So those are the things that we're going to have to do for the project. Put this here. The project will have the following uploaded. The, uh, I got I got I can't believe that I, for, I forgot the name of the file already. Uh, Checkout.java. And what was the name of this going to be? And try and use some reasonable one that is readable by a lot of people. PDF would be best. Because sometimes I got some weird, you know, um, word processor format that's from like the 1990s and nobody can read it anymore, but you have a copy of it. That's not going to work very well. And then they're going to have also the teamwork document. Okay, so all of these, I'm going to want only one of them, and that will be from your group. And then each individual has to do the group project survey on their own. Okay, 
As you can see, this is not exactly a trivial project. That's why I have giving you, I'm giving you more time. And if you need more time than that, I'm going to, we'll see how things are going. Okay. Um, but you'll definitely not want to delay starting on this. Do not wait until, uh, when is it due? March 7th to start it. That would be a really, really bad idea. And other than that, um, we're well, I only ran five minutes over. That's that's a new world's record for me. Uh, break time and lab time. If you still need to work on the stacks, that's fine. If you want to um, start um, communicating with the people in your group, and again, you should be able to see that if you go to the people and groups. Um, just click on the little arrow and you should be able to see who, they were randomly assigned. And yeah, let's see what happens here. Somewhere, like if I needed to talk to Kathy Jensen. Uh, you can send a message. So you can send messages to other people through Canvas that way. And of course, I'm a test student, so I don't have the ability to do that. Yeah. yeah, you folks know how to communicate electronically probably a lot better and collaborate electronically better than I do anyway, because I'm still stuck back in email mode. So, I mean, there's Discord. What else do you do? Do y'all folks use to communicate anyway when you have a group of people that you need to get together? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, group meet. Okay. Um, there's also Google Groups or something, isn't there? No, that that would be hard the hell to set up. But oh, let me you figure it out. You know how to do this stuff. If you if you are at a loss for what to um, set up, let's talk and let's do some research on it. Okay, uh, Professor, do you have any idea of, of what people could use for communicating? I leave it up to them. Anything is fine. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So when when the other professor does it in his class, he leaves it up to everybody and whatever they do is fine. Okay. Break time and lab time then. Um, I'm going to stop the meeting at some point then. Uh, I see that you found that you get rid of equal, equal. Okay, and let me stop the recording. Uh, Fung, do you have any questions? Online Fung, not, not, not in-person Fung. <laughs>